Hey, what's up everybody? It's Spencer, and today I'm gonna to show you guys how you can anodize your own aluminum parts right at home. So the other night I was out here welding and I managed to knock a full beer all over my Everlast 255 EXT TIG welder. And as you can imagine, I was pretty pissed off. So I figured I needed a cup holder of some sort so this wouldn't happen again, and so I could quit leaving rings on my really nice Serta flat welding table. Well, you could probably buy a cup holder, but I think it's always cooler when you just make something if you can. So my plan is to take this piece of flat stock here that I cut out in just a circle and take this piece of aluminum tubing that we had laying around at the machine shop where I work and uh, just weld them together like this along the seam here and then drill a hole straight through the center for for me to bolt that industrial magnet to and hopefully this will keep me from knocking a beer bottle over again so i'm just going to take it after i'm done uh welding it i'm going to anodize it i've been dying to anodize something purple i haven't done it yet so we'll see how it goes but the method is essentially the same for anything that you have to do if you want to anodize your own parts this is going to be a pretty pretty straightforward tutorial on how you could do that um, now i will mention that there are a few things that you should be aware of i'm gonna take this opportunity while i'm welding this up to explain some important factors that you guys should take into consideration before you try anodizing for yourself first of all are the warnings the chemicals used in this video are hazardous. Please ensure that you have proper ventilation. You don't want to breathe this stuff in. And keep some baking soda close by to neutralize the acid just in case you spill it on yourself or the ground or anything like that. Throw some baking soda on it. Wear gloves and eye protection at all times while you're messing with this stuff. And most importantly, don't be an idiot. Ask questions if you don't understand something. I'll be glad to answer them as quickly as I can. Now we can get into the stuff that you're gonna need to anodize. First thing, you're gonna need a plastic container. Tupperware or a bucket works, and preferably something with a lid so you can reuse it. Number two, a DC power supply. You can get one from Amazon or eBay. They range from about 40 bucks to about 80 bucks, depending on the amperage. Four to six amps works great. Number three, an aluminum bus bar to hang your parts on. Number four, aluminum or titanium wire to hang your parts from. 5356 or 4043 aluminum filler rod works great, but you have to throw it away every time. So titanium wire works great if you want to reuse it. Number five. You're gonna need a lead sheet to use as a cathode to line your anodizing solution container. The bigger the better for that, and you can pick it up on Amazon or eBay for relatively cheap. Number six, the anodizing solution. One part battery acid to three parts distilled water. And please, please, please make sure that you mix the acid into the water not water into acid or it could blow up in your face number seven you're going to need some acetone and simple green for cleaning and degreasing the parts number eight you're going to need personal protection equipment uh, for the love of god wear some gloves number nine you'll need the surface area of the parts that you plan to anodize I would do this before you purchase your power supply to make sure you have enough amperage for whatever part or parts that you're trying to do. You also need plenty of extra distilled water and two metal pots for dye and sealing. I'll explain this further later on. Getting the surface area of the part that you plan to anodize is a really important step. It doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but the closer you can get it, the better so that way you can set your amperage accurately. I'm just using Fusion 360 here to do it very, very quickly since the geometry is so simple, but you could actually do it with very simple geometric equations for the area of a cylinder and the area of a circle, and then multiply it by two to take into account 
both faces. What I'm going to do is draw the entire shape here and then I'm going to Google 720 anodizing calculator and then input the surface area for the part that I'm planning to anodize and it'll give me the correct amperage setting as well as the time required to do it, which is two hours. When you're anodizing, you're trying to get a one mil surface for the best dyeing capabilities. One mil is one thousandth of an inch. Because I already figured out that my surface area is 88 square inches, all I have to do is input that into the first line, set my thickness to one mil as I mentioned, and then I get 3.67 amps at 120 minutes. Now that we got all the startup crap out of the way, we can get going with the real deal. I just cleaned the part off with a rag with acetone on it before using some simple green. I let that sit for a few minutes and then I finally wash it off with some distilled water in a spray bottle. You can tell if the part's clean or not by if water beads up on the surface. If it beads up, it's not clean, so start over and clean it again. Here's my really simple anodizing setup. It's just a three gallon bucket with a resealable lid. I have my aluminum bus bar with titanium bolts in it, so that way I can hang my parts from it. The titanium just ensures that the bolts don't get corroded from the vapors coming off from the battery acid. Like I mentioned before, it's one part battery acid to three parts water, and I have a lead sheet in there to use as my cathode that I think I picked up off of eBay, but check your local scrapyard because you could find some for really cheap. I personally use a 10 amp DC power supply that I picked up off of Amazon. You can find them on eBay for pretty cheap, and like I said, just make sure you have the amperage capabilities for your parts. How you hang the part is really critical too. Here I have a long piece of 4043 aluminum filler rod in which I've annealed about eight inches of it or so, so that way I can bend it around really easy. This stuff is typically pretty hard and brittle, but if you anneal it, it's easy to work with. So now that we have the part hung inside of the anodizing bath, we can now hook up the positive lead to the aluminum bus bar right here and then the negative to the lead sheet to my power supply right there and then turn it on you want to make sure the knobs are all the way down you don't want to cook your hanging wires like if you were anodizing something much bigger the first time and then you come back and do something smaller and you left your machine exactly where it is it'll pick up where you left off so turn the knobs all the way counterclockwise before you turn it on it's important to note that you want to check the clearance of your part inside of the bath you don't want it to come in contact with your cathode over there or it'll short it out. So it needs to be suspended inside of the solution, not touching anything except for the hangers. After I have both of my leads hooked up and the machine turned on, I turn the voltage knob almost all the way maxed out. So that way when I start to turn the amperage knob up, it'll actually hold constant amperage and it'll compensate for the voltage that required to keep that amperage on its own. I slowly ramp up the amperage over the course of about five minutes until I get to 3.67, which is what we decided I needed from the 720 rule calculator. So you can really see the bubble starting to form. That's a good indicator that it's working correctly. Since you have two hours to kill while the part's in the anodizing bath, you can go ahead and mix up your dye. I buy mine from Caswell Plating. This is Violet DS. And it says on the small bottle to add the entire contents of the bottle to two gallons of distilled water and then heat it to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. I use stainless containers that I buy from Kroger. They're about 15 bucks a piece or something like that. And I have one for every color that I have so I can reuse it. Now you can give the container a good old mixing after you pour it in there, then put it up on the stove and get it warmed up to 140 degrees. That way when the part comes out of the anodizing bath, you can just drop it in. So after pulling the part out of the anodizing bath, I just drop it into the dye. Now this is something you'll have to play with for every color that you get. They all take a different amount of time to get the desired color. So for this one, I just started by pulling it every minute or so and checking it out and seeing what it looked like. Now, 
here comes the real kicker. Apparently I royally f***ed something up because this did not come out the way that I wanted it to. So at the time I had no idea what I did wrong, but then I started breaking down my setup and figured out that I had lost connectivity at some point so it only partially anodized. Luckily, we have simple chemistry on our side, so we can fix it. Time to do it again. If you're a dumbass like me and you completely screw it up, you can pull anodizing back off of a part and turn it back completely as it was before with one third of a cup of lye per gallon of distilled water. You can buy lye right off of Amazon for really cheap and then just put it in a bucket and it takes about five minutes to pull all the anodizing off of it and strip it back down. It does turn a pretty ugly gray color when you pull it back out, but it scrubs off really easy with some scotch Bright or a soft nylon brush and you're back to square one again. Since I figured out that I had a connectivity issue, I figured I didn't want to do that again, so I went to my mini lathe and I machined a nut and bolt out of aluminum that way I could really cinch the hangers onto the part to make sure I didn't lose connection halfway through again. Unfortunately, I had to completely reprep the part and rerun the process all over again, but we all screw things up from time to time and that's just part of it. And here it is, after all that trouble, I actually got somewhere. So after removing the part from the anodizing bath and cleaning it off with distilled water to make sure I don't get battery acid inside of my dye, I let it soak in the dye for about five minutes. Then I pull it out and give it a good rinse. Next, I have to put it in water that's heated to 180 degrees to seal off the anodizing. And remember not to touch it in between any of these steps or you might screw it up. And here we go. After all that work, I have the world's prettiest cup holder. I bolted an industrial size magnet to the bottom of it, so hopefully I wouldn't knock it over. Now I think I'm ready to drink some beer in style. Let me know if you guys have any questions. If any of this didn't make sense, drop a comment in the video and I'll be glad to get back to you. And if there's anything else you'd like to see me make or see how it's done, I'll be glad to show you. Thanks for watching.